such an ancient art. It is. How far back do you think it goes? I, I actually should know the answer to that off the top of my head. And I want to say 3000 BC, maybe? In Egypt, they, they found um, socks or the remnants of socks. So I'm an accidental, um, I don't really love the word expert, kind of has some ego in it, mm -hmm. but I know quite a bit about, um, about textiles accidentally. It's my passion. How did that happen? <laughs> well, let's see, when I was little, um, we did a lot of arts and crafts. I have um, eight siblings. I have this vague memory of once asked, telling my mother, like, thank you for all the arts and crafts. And I, I feel like her answer, I'm totally paraphrasing here, <laughs> but it was something like, I didn't, you know, less like, I didn't do it so much to inspire creativity, but more so that you all would leave me alone for an hour. So, you know, I wouldn't kill you or whatever. Um, and I, I took to crafting at a very, very young age. I started knitting in 1986 and I quit after my first scarf. It was, I just, I was, I'd had a trauma. My sister was teaching me to knit, one of my sisters, to help me calm down. But I poured all of my trauma into this n kind of naughty scarf and I set it down, I set down knitting for 14 years, I think, and then I picked it up again. But somewhere in the midst of all that, I was uh, writing features for the Dallas Morning News. I was a freelancer, and I had to generate as many ideas as I could, because if you don't generate ideas as a freelancer, you're not going to get paid. That's right. you got to go in, pitch pitch the pitch. managing editor, or, or pitch, pitch whomever. Pitch, pitch, pitch. Yeah, I did features, and so um, I, asked, I would ask friends for ideas, and one of my friends, who's an avid quilter, um, she said, why don't you do a piece about quilts? And so I, I wrote a piece about quilts and somehow that morphed into a book about quilts. And then that morphed into the beginnings of a documentary, which I never finished. I, I have some of the footage somewhere. And, and then that morphed into a second book about quilts. And then that morphed into a gigantic book about quilts. It's kind of like a comprehensive history of quilts throughout, you know, th like, the entire history of quilts. Um, wow. It was a difficult project. It didn't pay well. The book is massive. And sometimes if you look for it on Amazon, it's out of print. Sometimes the price point for used copies will be higher than I can afford um, because it's, there, they, there weren't that many of them. And it's full of all these, these pictures. And then, um, <clears throat> then that all happened like in the, I want to say that happened in the mid 2000s. I was born about six weeks after Kennedy was shot. Right. Mm -hmm. So it was a pretty tumultuous, I mean, it's always a tumultuous time, but of it was course. a pretty tumultuous time. And I was also born um, right after the publication of Feminine Mystique, which I yes. do think really had a huge impact. That would be Jermaine Greer? No, that was Betty Friedan. Betty Friedan, of mm -hmm. course it was. Mm -hmm. Thank and, you. Yeah, and, and there's, uh, I read a great book about the history of the Feminine Mystique, which is called A Strange Stirring, and it's by... Oh, I want to kick myself for not remembering. But it, it shows the impact that book had um, on women, and primarily middle class, upper mm -hmm. middle class white women. Uh, but I feel like the effects of that book definitely trickled down and touched my life. So I have three older sisters, and um, they went more traditional route in life, teacher, mm -hmm. secretary. I, um, who knows if the feminine mystique actually it, is contributed to how I turned out, how I'm turning out. Right. But I feel like, and you know, also I was born, I was five, four or five, the summer of love. Like there was so much um, protest. Uh, my sixth grade teacher who taught me how to play the guitar, she had been um, really active in, in this um, Vietnam War protest and stuff. Sure. So I, so I was shaped by, um, by activists who, who didn't necessarily use the word activist or feminist, but who role, role modeled for me. Yeah. You, you had a chance to say, <clears throat> wait a minute. I mean, like, who were you in high school? The overachiever of the universe. And I mean that in, in both directions. I'll tell you what I mean by that. So I was president of the student body, president of the student council. In New Jersey. In South Jersey, yeah. And I was, um, I, I was slated to graduate a year early because I had, fin I 
I was, um, I am, was academically very gifted. Yes. Gifted. We could even have a side conversation about the word gifted. Yeah. I, I did very well academically. Exactly. And I advanced through classes very quickly, mm -hmm. starting out like from first grade on. They kind of didn't know what to do with me. I'd wind up being sure. pushed into a lot of independent study. So when it came time, I was scheduled to graduate in 1982. Um, I was going to jump a year and then due to some bureaucratic changing of rules <laughs> I had to stick around so I didn't really have any classes to take and so what I did was I was president of the student council I was in all these clubs I was re really um, kind of overactive overachiever sure. on the one hand on the other hand I was already uh, I think it's it's uh, fair to say at that point I was deeply entrenched in alcoholism at that point although sure. we didn't call it that we called it like being a teenager in New Jersey I exactly. didn't know the word alcoholic so I was on it it was just strange right so I could how did the alcohol mitigate your learning ability because it I mean it, it affects it, it affects different people differently people don't it didn't it didn't I mean I could still like um I still excelled uh, I, with very little effort. You know, I graduated really close to the top of my class. And mm -hmm. I was not alone in this. So I went to this high school where it was a junior, senior high school. And when you entered in seventh grade, so seventh through twelfth, without any kind of, um, they didn't make any secrets about it. They, they organized us into ten groups. Mm -hmm. um, and they called us Section A through Section J. And if you were in Section A, you were like the smart kids, you sure. know, and, and, you know, imagine putting some, somebody saying, well, I'm in section J. It was a terrible system, wow. but in m section A, probably in the other sections too, there were, a, there were many of us who were overachieving mm -hmm. and who also drank like crazy. I mean, it was sure. the culture. We didn't have a lot of the awareness that we do now around like, oh, this addiction thing and kids. Mm -hmm. And, um, I don't think it affected me at all. I worked maybe 30 or 40 hours a week. I did my academics. I would run s events at the school. Um, I had a lot of energy. I think maybe the alcohol uh, was, I know it was like a buffer and an escape for me from mm -hmm. being in an abusive, having an abusive parent. Um, yeah, it was, and, and maybe, there's so many things I know now that I didn't know then, right? So I have post-traumatic stress disorder, and sure. I feel like underneath of that umbrella is the depression and the anxiety. So I feel like the alcohol was partly social lubricant. I'm also an introvert. I know I'm, I'm all the things, but whatever. It was a social lubricant. It was also um, a self-medication, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And you went... <clears throat> out of there were you spike then did you carry that i will tell you this and i don't often talk about my birth certificate name mostly the reason i don't talk about my birth certificate name well there's lots of reasons but one is sure. that i will i perform weddings as i have met i wear many hats but i'll, I'll do. about a half time half a dozen times a year some guy i'll call it the holy roller uncle will corner me at a wedding and demand to know my religious credentials and your name isn't really spike I'm just like whatever <laughs> but i'll tell you this because it's a fun little anecdote once people will often say like what's your given name yeah and I'll say, well, Spike was given to me. You know, it was given to me when I, I was 19. A, fr a friend of mine gave, told, gave me that I line. I love it. But I tell people, well, I'll let you take a guess. I'll say, um, I was born a few weeks after Kennedy was shot. And that, that, that's a clue. And once somebody said, is your name Oswald? <laughs> 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 but it's not. It, it's Jacqueline. And yeah. um, when I was in college, I was a... Uh, punk rocker. I mean, I still am a punk rocker, but I, mm -hmm. I had this hair, punk rock hair, haircut, and um, these frat boys were making fun of me and really rude. So I wrote this letter to the editor of the school paper. And at that point, I had recently been given the nickname Spike by a dorm mate. Sure. And so I signed the article, Jacqueline Spike Gillespie, and that was it, like off and running. Oh, yeah, God, how exciting. So that's been with me since I was maybe 19 years old. Thanks for all these questions. I feel so self-indulgent. I love telling the stories. Um, I started writing very early. Like, like the, as soon as I could hold a pencil and knew the alphabet and learn how to shape words, I would write a lot. And I have another theory about my writing, which is this, in um, the ha house I grew up in, yeah. we weren't allowed to speak. Li I mean that literally, we, we weren't allowed to speak when my father was in the house. 
and we were not allowed to have feelings or express feelings. I mean, obviously we had feelings, but you can express those. And so I think now looking back that my first addiction probably was books. I was a constant reader. It's wonderful. It's such a beautiful escape. And I, I still read all the time and I make, you know, I don't feel, I'm not gonna go to a recovery group for reading. Reading is my comfort. It's the yes. thing I do, but writing also. so. Uh, I started to write my first book when I was 10. I remember this. It was about a talking saxophone named Max. I didn't finish it. But from the early on, and I would win um, essay contests in like fifth grade. You know, I'd win. I'd write like, you know, firefighters are good or pollution is bad. And it's entirely possible I won because I may have been one of like the only entrants or something. And I'm not being self-deprecating. I'm saying I contextually I don't know the circumstances sure. but whatever the case that um was external validation mm. and it inspired me to keep going so i wrote for the high school newspaper and i wrote for the a lot of the content in my my senior year book um and then in college when i wrote this angry letter to the editor they said um we want to run this as a guest column and we'd like to give you a job and so that angry letter my anger see anger can be a uh, anger is an energy johnny rotten said that you know yeah yeah so yeah. that's how it, it's been with me for it's been with me forever yeah and and so much of your writing is about your experience of life and your experience and your healing and your wholeness. So there is a therapeutic component? There, there is. And, you know, I think some people, I'll let the defensive part of myself answer first. And, please, you please. Know, would, you, like, would you call the committee I, to the committee's, uh, in, yeah, the committee's, committee's in, in session and, well, and allow, like, uh, allow the first, uh, we, 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 we shall recognize the defensiveness. <laughs> Thank yes, you. Please. I appreciate that. Well, you know, there are definitely, everyone's going to have their critics, right? And I... I unfortunately, you know, I have that. I do have the internal committee, but I know that the, my writing is not for everyone. And I, in one particular mm -hmm. interview, you know, maybe we'll talk about this later, but uh, it, that was in the Texas Observer. Sure. Was it was just the writer eviscerated me. It was a complete character assassination, and he was so like angry. Yeah. And years later, I met one of his ex girlfriends at a party, and he told me that she told me that he had really serious mother issues, and that she really felt like this had mm -hmm. informed his. I mean, he just, it was, it was so horrible. This was before the Texas Observer was online and all my yeah. friends who saw it, they would, they refused to give me copies and I couldn't <laughs> find a copy in the store. Like it was really, you can still find it online. Yeah. But, um, so my writing is not for everybody, but I'll say this. I think first and foremost, it brings healing to my life, but I will say, um, I get a, a fair amount of reader mail that, mm -hmm. that indicates to me, people will say things like, you know, wow, I could never have said that m myself in writing or out loud. I might lose my job or my kid or my marriage or my sanity. Yeah. Um, I appreciate you saying that. And the way that I feel, the way I've tried to describe it sometimes is, sometimes I feel almost like I was born without a filter. People will say, you're so courageous, you're so brave. And I feel like, Again, when I use the word gift, I use it carefully. I had someone get very angry at me once for that because he felt like I was saying that I am gifted and other people aren't. What I was trying mm -hmm. to express to him was sometimes I feel um, like uh, I'm channeling. You know, I know that can Thank sound you. corny, but I feel like this last book that I just wrote, and we can talk about that in a little bit, it, it feels like pure channeling so it's not mm -hmm. like I'm I don't really feel brave and courageous necessarily I feel like these things happen to me I need to to um exercise them from me and, yes. and hope and if they serve other people well that's great God. you know you know the the evolution one of the things that I want to talk about is is how do we avoid because I any the, the instant that I get into the comparative mode I lose. I lose my peace of mind. I lose my spontaneity. I lose because the instant I'm in, in that comparative mode. So staying out of the comparative and saying that, okay, well, I have one job and that's to be, I am identically unique and I have one job and that is to be the absolute best manifestation of Dennis Tardon that I p can possibly, I don't have I cannot compare myself to Spike. I cannot compare myself to, I have to have that, that unique, and I, so I use that as my condition. I love that. I'm going to carry that with me. Thank you. That's really powerful. That's really powerful. 
how, can you talk about your evolution of, because before we get into the, because I want to get into the book and I want to get into the new projects and I want to get you to, but I want to get some foundational stuff. How has this evolved in your own understanding of a power greater than you are? Because both of us have experienced time. We've been with friends, uh, with friends in in recovery, and, and who choose to be anonymous and for 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 years and years. And and this evolution of of a higher power, whatever that means. And how can you talk about that evolution in your life? I can, and I want to. I think I'm understanding the question clearly. I'll riff on it. We'll see how. Well, yeah. There is no wrong yeah. answer. I was raised. Um, with Catholicism, and I, and I, in my memory, in my, in my version of the story, and I practice. I love versions. Well, I qualify it now because I do have eight siblings, and if we were ever a study group, we all have. I mean, it's it's really fascinating, you know. Isn't it? But though? I, yes, yes. And so I was raised with Catholicism, and I like to say that my father had his own special brand. It's like there was, as if it weren't enough fire and brimstone. Uh, I would be told with regularity that I was going to hell and that God was punishing me. Mm -hmm. Now, despite this, I um, I took to Catholicism like I, I was very serious about it from a very early age. I was the youngest lector at our church. I was I was maybe I don't know maybe twelve or thirteen. I would get up and read the Gospels. It's funny to even have that memory. Um, I would go to Good Friday services on my own, which is not a holy day of obligation, but it's the you know the three hours sure. where Christ is dying on the cross. Um, I have a really vivid memory once of of I don't remember who came in first, me or my father, but this weird. I think part of my dedication was maybe he was so connected to his religion that I wanted to connect with him. Sure. And I wanted this bolt of lightning experience. Well, not only did I not get that, but to really fast forward the story, the first maybe the first time my father disowned me was probably around the time I, I ditched the Catholic Church. Um, and, you know, that's a really painful and, and, and fed a lot of the anger that I had that maybe I didn't even know that I had. It's my identity's lost now, right? So I don't know what to do with myself. Sure. Um, and then I would say, I guess maybe a atheist, agnostic. I feel like they're, they're one and the same. Yeah. Um, and uh, in, in college and then somewhere along the way, um, I started reading Buddhist philosophy. And even still, like, I call myself a quasi-Buddhist. I don't, I really don't want to get attached, and that's a good Buddhist way to be, to any, like, <laughs> organized religion. So I've been on meditation retreats and stuff, but I really feel like um, I like the philosophy of it. And then, so then it, when I finally, uh, when I say finally, I, I, I quit, um, well, I, I know in anonymous programs, we don't specifically identify which ones we're in, but uh, I will say that I stopped sure. drinking in 2000 with a few single days out. Yeah. I didn't step into the rooms until the end of 2017. One big thing that kept me out or that I told myself kept me out was I knew the word God was going to be bandied about a lot. I had tiptoed into the rooms once or twice. Yeah. And and to this day, when I'm chairing a meeting, or even if I'm only sharing, if it's a God-heavy meeting, uh, much to the irritation of the, of the more traditionally <laughs> religious people in the room, I will always say, if you don't believe in God, and if, this, if you're a newcomer, and and you and this is scaring you. Yeah. Can we cuss in here? Yep. If this is scaring the shit out of you or making you want to run away and never come back, if you want to talk to somebody about how could how can an atheist or I call myself non-theistic, I think that's right. a better way to put it. Um, how can I be in this room and hear this language? And some people might get upset and be like, "Well, it just it's just shorthand for this or that." For me, the the word God and religion itself was used as a tool of abuse. I take language Words seriously. matter. They do. I take language really seriously. So getting around to higher power, um, you know, I ha had this roommate, Bob, and I know we'll talk about Bob in a little bit. But when I thought, it, yes, it, I have no trouble understanding there's something greater beyond me. Connection, yeah. whatever, butterflies, my dogs, the way I talk to, um, like, have an, an instant connection sometimes with a a cashier or something, yep. I get it. But for, to like designate something or some notion to a specific higher power for me to talk to, I can't remember when I decided it was Bob, my former roommate, but I, I 
that works so well for me because um because Bob loved me unconditionally. He was mm -hmm. so gentle. And even when he saw me making really poor choices where I was really hurting myself, like in ways that would have been obvious to like a drunken two-year-old, but I couldn't see for myself, he would never be harsh with me. He would only love me like I, like a feral animal that he was coaxing back to health. And so I talk to Bob all the time. That's an easy one. So ironically, he's a spike whisperer. He is. And ironically, you know, he's, uh, uh, you know, he, he's a white dude, an older white dude, which is yeah. like the kind of image of God isn't that I it? wanted isn't to. Isn't it? Oh. <laughs> and a Republican, I might add, you know. Yeah. But uh, that's okay because. But you have to have well. that. See, see yeah. th th that's what I love about about the story has to have that. Are yeah. you kidding? I mean, it has to have that in order in order to be the story. Well, and the inoculation is often comes from the. I mean, it comes from the whatever, the the causes the disease. You know, exactly. I think about that. Yeah, the vaccine. Yeah. Yeah. And there, there you have it. So here, in in this sense, uh, in the 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 understanding of a power greater than than, than we are. If if like I'm a fish and I'm in the ocean, and I'm not even thinking about that I'm in the water. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's like if there is nothing separate from, then how, then there isn't an outside to be looking at it from, at us from the outside. That, I, 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 there, there, it's, it's an all, it's this wonderful immersion it sense. Is. And so there is no not. I grew up Christian science. You know, oh. that, that scientist and all that. And one of the phrases that they had in there is that there is not a spot where God is not. I love it. So, there, so, so that, that just encompasses it all. All right, so now what we make out of this, that's a different thing. That, now, I might have an opinion, but it's certainly not going to change this, this in, in, entire uh, element. There, there is no judgment in that sense outside of what we all are. Right. And I, I like this whole no judgment thing. I mean, I'm a, I, I'm a very judgy person. I'll be honest with you. Are you kidding? I, I love your blue shirt. So I mean, you yes, know, there you yes. go. And judgment. Judgment. There, there is no, no, I don't think that there is, um, judgment is such an important uh, aspect of it. And when I think about judgment, okay, is that if uh, I can have discernment. I was going to say discernment. I love that you picked that word. Yes, discernment. And uh, because w w when I have judgment, there is something about it that I'm having to make someone else wrong. Right. As opposed to, and I'm really getting a chance to, right, I mean, right now as we're, as we're looking at this, uh, here in, in August of 2019, we're, we're looking about, we're coming up upon an uh, election season and we're getting an opportunity and we're looking at these, that, that human beings is that it appears as if that the media, not just the media, but, it, but certain aspects of our society are attempting to divide us to say that we're separate. Yes, That yes. we're separate, that we have, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to meet you and get to know you, is because you have the exact opposite philosophy that we are together. We are together, whether we like it or not. And I say that, but I want to point out that, um, you know, despite that being my philosophy or my belief, I could give you easily off the top of my head 50 examples of how I don't necessarily practice what I what I um, uh, purport to believe in, like with with and it, because it's hard to be a human yep. on the planet, you yep. know. So I, I want to own that part. Thank of it. you. Yeah, I want to. I don't want to. I don't have it not mm -hmm. all figured out. I don't have any of it figured out. None of it. I, I, I you know, Spike and I love that because the it is hard. Life is hard, one day at a time. I, I, I love some of the stories from the big book because you sit there and the person will get sober and then you know, you, and then you think, okay, well, that's the end of the story. But no, then their kid dies yes. and, then they're, and then they go through a divorce and then they get a, a, a bankruptcy and then they have to go to jail and they have to go to bed and then they come back and they go, well, <laughs> I'm, I'm still sober and I'm learning and I'm growing and, and it's just not, uh, life is complicated. 
Life is, and I I love those parts of the stories too because um, when I first got into the rooms, I another thing that kept me out. Well, I kept myself out. That would be the way I would say it now that I've been in for for yeah. not quite two years. But I I didn't like the word um, powerless because I didn't feel powerless. I put down the drink. Uh, and stayed away from it for the better part of 17 years. Like, I like to always own this couple of day sure. exceptions. That feels important. But um, when I finally got a sponsor, which took me a while, I was afraid of everything when I went in there. And, and I had emotionally bottomed out. That's what sent me in. And I was, I was a wreck. I was fending off suicidal ideation on a regular basis. I was... Um, I write about it at length in, in the Dow of Bob. But anyway, when I when I did get a sponsor, and I was very fortunate, I, I chose an incredible sponsor, and she's still my sponsor. And she said, when I said the word powerless, is like I, it's too hard for me to deal with. I don't feel powerless. And she said, well, why don't you look at the other word in there, which is unmanageable? Well, I can really connect with unmanageable quickly. And since yes. she, she was really gentle, I know some people have hard ass sponsors, and she yeah. was very... She is very gentle and compassionate. And in helping me start that way, like in, instead of saying, this is why you have to understand the word powerless, she said, well, let's look at the other part of the sentence. And in that gentleness and compassion, slowly it opened up my eyes and my ears and my heart that now I can, I, don't, I still don't always love the word powerless, but I, I can connect with yeah. it more than I could initially. Yeah. I love the unmanageability because the, uh, the idea of unmanageable, it keeps me in the idea of uh, manageable is results orientation. Mm -hmm. If I could just make this situation come out, this person, this, this come out in a certain way, then it's going to feed me or get me in, in something. But I'm powerless. I'm, they, people are unmanageable. People, they events, sure are. <laughs> footwork, now, that, now that, that I can do. Right. Footwork is my job. Yeah. Results? Can't get attached. I mean, you can get attached. I get attached to results and outcome off. all the time, and I and that's a really big thing I'm working on right now. It's funny. I'm attached to the outcome of letting go. Of exactly. The attached outcomes. There's some. Absolutely. Which is <laughs> uh, which is that mirror Puzzling. effect, right? It is the okay. mirror effect. Yeah. Yeah. And that and, and that's where. So so let's let's talk about let's talk about the the. Um, you're a writer. You're being published in, in, in not just the Dallas Morning News, but you're being published around. And so what, what is life like to, or you're thinking about that as part of your career path, your life path, the story of Spike? Well, actually, um, so in 2010, I always remember this. I, I remember things, like my timelines are usually connect to um, an unfortunate relationship I was in, yeah. or um, an international location. A series where of I was. unfortunate relationships. Yeah, yeah, well, that, that, that was yeah. a great title. Or, or it'll, <laughs> it'll connect to like um, where I have a really incredible memory, um, which we don't have time to discuss, but I can remember like names and dates. I can tell you the middle name of the best friend of a guy I dated for like.